Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. And I'm Ali Yamashita. In our show this time, we'll take a look at the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education at UH Manoa. We'll take a tour around Seymour Halle with its director Dave Carl, and we'll hear some of the students report on their research there. This all began in a Think Tech talk show we did a few days ago with Dave Carl, a member of the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. He was on our KHPR radio show a few years ago and has been a long-term friend of ThinkTech. We met Dave just outside Seymour Halle and he told us about its origins. Even from the outside, we could tell that Seymour is not an ordinary building or program. And this is a lead platinum building. It's the only lead platinum laboratory in the state of Hawaii. It's very difficult to get lead platinum certification. The lead of, is the leadership in energy efficient design. It's an architectural competition for energy efficiency. And you can see at the, taking a look at the building, we've got the photovoltaics on the roof. We've got a, a solar water heater. It's really the only bu building on campus like that. All of this uh, glass facade is a uh, three pane glass with an inner gas in between panes two and three, which allows a lot of light to get into the building, but very little heat. And you'll see this when we go into the building we love the building. It's, it's not only attractive, uh, it's, it's functional, and it's, uh, it's been extremely uh, useful for the work that we're doing. Good morning. Good morning. We'll see you in the auditorium. It's uh, USA and, and uh, Taiwan. Seymour is a National Science Foundation Center of Excellence, and after we were awarded a 10-year project from the National Science Foundation, this is really the gold standard of NSF, uh, the university administration and leadership thought, well, where are you going to do this work? Uh, do you have sufficient space? And we said, uh, no, we really need a place to put everything together. And that uh, was the original thought for, for this beautiful building that we now call Seymour Halle, the, the home of Seymour. I'll stop right here for a second and tell you one of the architectural designs of this building was to, to build a beautiful uh, landscape as well as the, the functional building. And, this uh, paver that you see in front of you is not just a, a very nice uh, artistic design, but these are in fact fossil microorganisms from the deep sea sediments of the Pacific Ocean that were recovered in the late 1800s and drawn into a notebook by a very famous uh, naturalist named Ernst Haeckel. We were able to go to the UH Hamilton Library and get uh, the original drawings from the Challenger report and send them off to our architectural team who commissioned these pavers uh, from China. So this is the building, and, and I said the, the building is a lead platinum building. It's got a lot of design features. Uh, it's built as an addition to the old biomedical building behind us, which itself is a famous building because it was built by Edward Durrell Stone, or designed by Edward Dur Durrell Stone, a very famous architect. And we had to preserve the entranceway of that building. So you see that we snake our way through this wonderful hallway, well-lit and, and attractive. Uh, there's not a single straight line in this building, and you'll see that when we go into it, and that's by design. Please, come on in. Then he took us into the facility, and he showed us the office and laboratory spaces there. It's a really beautiful building. When you have a lead project, you've got to tell the uh, organization that, that's, that's actually called um, the Green Building Council in New York City. That's who you actually report to. So the architects have to fill out a, 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 a report card showing what the features are of the building that have gained you energy efficiency. We have this beautiful living wall to, to welcome people. And uh, this, this is designed uh, by us, uh, for us, and we take care of it too. So this is uh, kind of outside the jurisdiction of the university. <laughs> In fact, they didn't want this, and of course we wanted it, so there it is. Let's take a walk uh, down the corridor, well, you'll see that we have made maximum use of light with these large communicating windows. In fact, the, the original design was to have uh, no walls at all, just to have an open architecture. But uh, because these, you know, the faculty like to be in an office, we decided to have offices. So here's uh, a typical office. Actually, it's not a typical <laughs> office. This happens to be my office, and it's a little bit messy at the present time. But I'll just show you a few things. We we pitched the ceiling up to collect as much light as we possibly could. We have these uh, architectural light shades here, these eyelashes, if you will, on the windows. And these are features that bounce additional light in without uh, directly heating. This is, you know, it's kind of 
uh, where I do my do my work standing up. It uh, keeps me alert. It's hard to fall asleep standing up, even if you're bored. Um, and it makes uh, meetings very short. If students or people come in and they want to talk to you, if you sit down, you're stuck for 30 minutes. If you stand up, then it's like, okay, what do you need? So these are staff offices, faculty offices. We have a small mail room. Uh, postdocs are in here. So altogether, there's maybe 35 people in the building. And that's a mixture of students. We have undergraduate students in the building, graduate students, postdocs, faculty, and uh, staff, administrators. So we wanted to have a, a th th you saw that this is mostly offices. We have a small conference room at the end. The students are working in there in the last minute preparation. Uh, but we wanted to have a nice connection up to the laboratories on the second floor. So instead of having a concrete stairwell like most of the buildings on campus, we wanted to have a beautiful uh, connecting staircase. So this is what we call the grand staircase. This is a metal and terrazzo freestanding staircase and this beautiful glass again by Kula on Maui and we have these uh, microbial fossils. And if you've been to laboratories before and you probably have, you'll see that this one doesn't look like many of the labs you've been in. I mean we got this beautiful again wallpaper. These are uh, stainless bumpers to keep the walls looking nice because we push carts around with uh, samples and with gear. Uh, so um, we'll take a walk down here and then go, th go through the labs. Again, we've got these large communicating windows. Uh, usually in a lab, you've got a little window and you're looking through to see if somebody's in there. We have these large open labs with uh, communicating windows. Now, you can't eat or drink in labs. That's a safety issue. So we decided to put some coffee tables oh, here so people idea. could just come out of the lab and have a cup of coffee and continue to talk science. So there's no reason to to not continue to do science, uh, even when you're on a coffee break or if you want to come out here and debate something with your colleague. <laughs> Just small things. Uh, freezers are typically the size of a door. So instead of building a door, we build a door and a quarter and a door and a half so that when you want to bring a big freezer in here, you don't have to take the door off. And that's something we learned from uh, the, tw the 25 years I was here in other buildings. The entire building is keyless, and everybody has a code. And when you put the code in, it registers the code. So we know kind of what the traffic is. Everything is, uh, all the lights are, are occupancy sensors, so they go down. The air conditioning is occupancy sensor. It's tied to the lights, so when there's no people in here, a long holiday weekend, the air conditioning shuts down. Uh, Seymour is, is a program that's, that has as its mantra uh, genomes to biomes. Now, genomes are the blueprints of life, and that's what we have. That's what every form of life has a, a unique DNA barcode. So we are looking at everything from the barcode up to the very highest levels of organization, what we call the ecosystem. So this lab, uh, this beautiful lab with, uh, we've e even got a clerestory window up here. You can see the natural light that spills down. So that's a design feature. Uh, we have the broad open ceilings to give you the, the idea of, of openness. So this would be an instrument that we use in the biomes research. This is an instrument that measures nutrients in seawater. Nutrients are the fertilizer of the sea, so things like nitrogen and phosphorus. These are measured with this instrument. Over here, we've got the carbon dioxide. And ever since uh, 1957, as you might know, uh, Charles Keeling has been measuring carbon dioxide at the summit of Mauna Loa Observatory on the Big Island. Well, ever since 1988, since the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program got started, we've been measuring carbon dioxide in the ocean. And we see, essentially, that the ocean is increasing its carbon dioxide burden, just like the atmosphere is. And because of that, the ocean is becoming more acidic. So here you see the acidification of the ocean. And this is one of two data sets around the entire world where you can actually see this in, in real time, the other one being off Bermuda. And we helped to found the Bermuda program as well. So this Hawaii Ocean Time Series program that I know you, you've talked about before, Jay, on your shows, uh, this is one of two sites in the world uh, where we can make these measurements. All of my students and, and staff are out at, out at sea right now. That Otherwise, this place would be buzz, buzzing. And then a lot of the, the rest of them are waiting for this symposium. So the labs are really quiet. It's a good time to tour, but it, it gives you the wrong impression. I mean, this. Uh... So this is uh, one large lab, the biomes lab. And we wanted to make this lab, the, the entire second floor, a single big lab like this. But the air conditioning people said, no, we need an air conditioned break. So this set of small rooms in the middle is breaking the, the main lab floor into two uh, equal labs. Now this is a, um, 
a new part of the center. Ed DeLong was just hired here, as you know, and he immediately bought a new Illumina sequencer. This is a DNA sequencer. Se sequencer. So this is what you would use to get this uh, nucleotide base sequence of life. So we go out in the ocean and sample DNA. It's just like you would do in forensic science. You bring it back to the lab and you want to know whose DNA it is, so you sequence it with this uh, beautiful tabletop sequencer. It's pretty amazing because only 20 years ago, you, you would need an entire lab like this to do what this machine does, and you'd need uh, several tens of millions of dollars instead of uh, several hundred thousand dollars. So everything is, is being miniaturized, it's dropping in cost, and that's allowed us to really go out and, and very aggressively determine the blueprint of the entire ocean, and that's what we're in the process of doing. This is the Genomes Lab, and on this side, um, we've got uh, materials that would be used for molecular biology analysis. This happens to be a brand new instrument also that DeLong br brought uh, with him. And this is a, a DNA extraction system. So this is a robot. This is an automated system. You load it up and uh, turn the switch and hope that everything goes well, and you can monitor it as it's doing its job, but you can extract um, many, many samples simultaneously using this uh, heavy-duty robot, which if you look here, it's, it's a very interesting thing. This, um, you would put a plate in here with a number of different wells. Here's an example of that. And uh, this plate matches all of these arms, which are magnetized, and the working material uh, for the extraction is actually um, magnetic beads. And what this machine does is to magnetize and demagnetize the beads. And that you can use that as a way of moving DNA around because it's adsorbed onto the magnetic bead. You can pick it up and then you can turn off the magnet and the beads drop into the next solution that would be used to do the extraction. So this is, instead of doing every one of these by hand, you just use this, this robot. One thing in the business of DNA is is uh, storing DNA samples at very low temperatures. And these low temperature freezers are notorious for giving off a lot of heat. It's just like your refrigerator at home except times 10. And they make a lot of noise. That's just the nature of the instrument. So when designing this building, we decided to build a whole room that we had extra air conditioning and extra insulation. So you can walk by here and never hear the groaning of these low temperature freezers. But this one, for example, is kept at minus 72 degrees centigrade. So these are very, very low temperature. And this is what you need to store the DNA uh, for very long periods of time. And these all have uh, monitors on them. And, and if they drop below a certain set point, they'll phone you up, send a text message, uh, because these are really the the, this is the Fort Knox of the DNA. This is where the DNA is stored and we need to be absolutely certain that it's stored within a certain temperature range. We do a lot of microscopic uh, measurements at a number of different, with a number of different instruments. This happens to be a, a laser-based flow cytometer. Now what this instrument does is uh, you take a sample of seawater that has, and I was telling this to Jay on his show, that it might have a million microbes in a small one milliliter volume of seawater. And you can take that volume of seawater and pass it in a fluid stream through this instrument that has five lasers interrogating at a common point. And as every particle, every microorganism or every particle of organic matter goes through that interrogation point, this machine collects information about it. How big is it? How much light is it scattering? What color is it fluorescing? And based on those properties, we can identify these particles as either living particles or dead particles, phytoplankton particles, those that have pigments because they'll fluoresce, and those that don't. And we can stain them with DNA stains and determine how much, roughly how much DNA each one has. And then we can make a decision as to whether to collect a certain type of particle or not. So as these particles are going on this fluid stream at about 30 miles an hour, this machine can identify from information we give it a particle and pull it out of the fluid stream and put it into a test tube. So over time, we can collect exactly the types of cells that we want to work with for downstream analysis, whether it's DNA analysis or in the case of uh, we've been using this a lot for looking at which organisms are metabolizing which kinds of sugars or 
or taking up which kinds of phosphorus. So this is called a flow cytometer. It was developed in the biomedical industry in the 1960s and been improved ever since. This is now a very small, the first generation flow cytometers would have taken up this whole room. They were all water-cooled lasers. These are now air-cooled lasers, a very compact lasers, very high-powered lasers. And we can take this out to sea. So the, the crews that just got back this morning had an identical instrument on the ship. So we keep one down at the Marine Center, we keep one in this lab, so we have the luxury of having two of these. So we've got uh, conventional microscopes um, that we use all the time to, to look at the microorganisms in seawater. Uh, nowadays these powerful what we call fluorescence microscopes use uh, ultraviolet light instead of visible light and they interrogate uh, dyes that are used to bind to DNA of the, of the cells. So we make cells visible in different colors by using different dyes. And everything nowadays, I mean, the students can barely stand to look through a microscope anymore like I used to do when I was a student. Everything is digital and, and uh, everything is done now on the computer screens along with all the analysis of the samples. So there are computer programs that size the cells and give you dimensions and, and actually count the cells as opposed to having to do that manually. We've got a small room back here, it's a dark room, mm -hmm. so we do uh, x-ray work and some um, uh, work that we call autoradiography, which is essentially uh, similar to, um, it's similar to uh, x-ray photography. And we've got another microscope here, so we've got uh, plenty of room in here in this small compact lab to do everything you need to do with uh, light microscopy. And uh, we have access on campus to uh, Electron microscopes, which are more powerful, they have a higher resolution uh, potential, and those are run as facilities uh, in various laboratories uh, here on campus, including SOEST. We were impressed, if not amazed, at the careful design of the building, the attention to detail in constructing the spaces and outfitting the laboratories, offices, and presentation rooms. Then we got a chance to meet and see some of the graduate student researchers at Seymour, many of whom were from research universities in other countries as they presented their work. So this uh, is not a classroom, it's a science conference room. Uh, there's been a lot of campus activities up here. Everybody has an internet and a plug right at their desk. Uh, we've got microphones here that uh, if, you, if you push this, one of these tracking cameras comes in and so for the video conferencing you know exactly who's, who's asking the question. We've got the two high-definition projectors, and you can put them on the same screen and do 3D projection, or you can use the two screens. We've got a digital wall in the back. I don't know, is the screen down now? Yeah, but underneath the, the main screen, we've got a, a computer screen wall, uh, what we call the... So you can do projection? Yeah, and, and you can use each, each tile as a separate image, or you can use all the tiles together. So these are the students. There's um, 16 students in the summer course, and they're from, as I mentioned, nine different countries. We've got uh, former Soviet Union, we've got Chile, we've got Germany, we've got France, we've got um, Taiwan, we've got Korea, and many others. So this is, um, is the course is microbial oceanography? Yeah, the course is microbial oceanography. It's uh, now in its ninth year. So we've trained uh, over 100 international students so far. Many of them are in the, running their own labs now. It's great to see them at national meetings and they say, oh yeah, I was in class uh, number one, number two, or whatever. And uh, they, they have these peer groups that they carry throughout their entire career. So these kids have been working together, living together, literally, for five weeks. And today, this morning, is the culmination of, of some of that work. They, for the last week, have been working on samples that were collected at Station Aloha, so they're going to make a presentation of what they learned. The whole point of this training course is to get them trained to do this, and, and um, I think you'll, you'll see when they start speaking that they took their mission pretty seriously, and um, they're, you know, these are the top students around the world. The work that they're going to be reporting here would be a, you know, similar to a PhD dissertation that would take somebody four years to complete. So they've just really taken the what we call the low-hanging fruit, looking at some of the broad features at Station Aloha and putting them into a ecological and, and a biogeochemical context. And this is what we're trying to do in the center as a whole. So it's, it's pretty remarkable to see 
what they can do in such a short period of time. That's really what we're striving to do, get people of the quality that, that all of these young scholars are and um, you know, build something really big here. And that's what we're going to do in Scope. Uh, this new program I was talking to you about is going to be like Seymour, but actually much larger. Meet you. Miss Linda is from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but she's actually from Singapore. Why did you decide to come here to Hawaii for this program uh, here at Seymour? Um, because of the reputation of the program, um, I, I feel that I will learn a lot um, and which will benefit my research. This summer, this is the ninth year we've been doing this course. It's a advanced graduate uh, training course in microbial oceanography. And we've had students here uh, for the past approximately four weeks learning about microbial oceanography, uh, conducting field work, and laboratory analyses. Uh, one of the highlights of this course is the field component. We had a seven-day research cruise out to Station Aloha where the students learned how to make productivity measurements deploy field equipment, um, do molecular biological analyses, and brought those samples back to the lab and did a wide range of different analyses to try to make sense and get a description of the habitat of the oligotrophic open ocean at Station Aloha. These scholars are dedicated to their work and world class in their presentations. We were impressed and we could also see that Dave Carl was proud. Together, they are a phenomenon. It was an extraordinary experience and a real treat to visit Seymour, to spend the time and take the tour with Dave Carl, to see the facility and laboratories and instruments, and to meet and hear his students report on their work. We are pleased to be able to tell you about Seymour. Now that you know about it, you should learn more at seymour.soes.hawaii.edu and follow the microbial oceanography going on there. Thanks and kudos to Dave Carl for this Manoa miracle. Remember, Hawaii is an ocean state with a wealth of scientific knowledge from and about the ocean. The quest for this knowledge is our history, our culture, our legacy, and our future. And learning about it is our obligation. And now, let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts video and audio for all our talk shows live on the internet from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. If you miss a show or want to replay or share any show, they're all archived on YouTube. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links or to join our email list and get these links and advisories on our upcoming shows. We also invite you to be part of our live audience at our downtown studio in Pioneer Plaza. Contact Jay at thinktechhawaii.com. Raise your awareness in every way on ThinkTech.
On Thursday, July 22nd, ThinkTech will join with the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum to present the Hawaii Clean Energy Day program for 2014, which will be at the downtown Laniakea YWCA. You can sign up to attend this program on hawaiienergypolicy.hawaii.edu. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Castle & Cook Hawaii, 160 years of investing in Hawaii, creating communities and providing for the needs of our state. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry to make better informed property investment decisions. The Foreign Trade Zone, bringing the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. Galen Ho, a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island. Hawaii Energy, your energy conservation and efficiency program created to help Hawaii residents and businesses adopt a clean energy lifestyle. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, incorporating diverse perspectives into the design of a forward-looking energy strategy. Hawaii Gas, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Hawaii Pacific Health, bringing technology and teamwork together to transform healthcare in Hawaii. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency. The Scheidler Family Foundation, supporting many educational, cultural, and charitable organizations in Hawaii, including ThinkTech. Okay, Ali, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Jay Fidel does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. Definitely, Duke. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com, be a guest, a volunteer, a producer, or intern, and help us reach Hawaii. I'm Duke Oishi. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. You can watch the show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. Aloha, everyone. I'm Ali Yamashita. See you next time. Think Tech is thought-provoking and philosophical.